This week's episode of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast is brought to you by listeners like you. Head on over to patreon.com slash run, eat, drink podcast and subscribe today. Fans, founders, and insiders like you help us keep the Run, Eat, Drink podcast going. And we thank you for your support. Hi, I'm Jeff Galloway, and you are listening to the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. Welcome to the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. We feature destination races from across the country. And after the race, we take you on a tour of the best local food and beverage to celebrate. So whether you are an elite runner or a back of the packer like us, you'll know the best places to accomplish, explore, and indulge on your next runcation. Hey, welcome to episode 125 of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. I'm your host, Amy. And I'm your co-host, Dana. Welcome to a show that will recap a wonderful day at Disney. Yes, we actually got to do a little bit of traveling. Yes. So we're actually back to being a travel podcast for runners. It's true. We changed locale for a training run. It was not a formal race. Okay, that's just, just a technicality. You know, just disclaimer or <laughs> what technicality, whatever. Yeah. Okay. But it was exciting to be able to have a change of scenery, accomplish a goal, explore and indulge. Some place that's not here at the house. Right. Or in the neighborhood. Right. Yeah. In terms of the running scenery. And it's going to give us a great opportunity to let you all out there know if you're thinking about doing a trip to the Walt Disney World area, to the Magic Kingdom, to Epcot, to any of the parks that we talk about, kind of what you can expect a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not going to dive too, too deep into you know, all of the the protocols, but we'll give you kind of a general overview of what you could expect and what our impressions were from being in the parks right now as we're dealing with the pandemic. Yes. So we will also give you a look at a couple of booths, an oldie and a newbie. That that was kind of weird. Yeah. I guess. But it worked. It worked. It works. An oldie but a goodie and then a brand new taste from the epcot food and wine festival 2020 which has been running since july 15th which makes this i believe the longest it's been running ever Ever. right and (laughs) and truth be told i was shocked that it was running i didn't know until last week that the food and wine festival was even going on yeah yeah i kind of assumed probably like many of our listeners out there, that the festivals were all put on hiatus for well, the time being. Like the like the Halloween party, like well, we haven't officially heard about the the Christmas party. But, right. You know, you would think they eliminated fast passes, they eliminated some dining experiences. And most anything that involves large crowds of people standing around one another. Parades. Which basically is the Epcot Food and Wine Festival. I mean, oh, character meet and greets, yes. Yes. So, at any rate, there is still fun to be had at Disney. And we had some. Yeah. And we had amazing food and drink, and we did get a training run in. Mm-hmm. So... I'm excited to kind of dive yeah. into this week, this week's uh, race. And, Shall we? You know, if we had timed it differently, we could have done one of our virtual 5Ks yeah. this weekend. I realize now we have missed the mark, huh? We missed the mark there, but you know what? It's okay. We can always just say, hey, you know, the 5K that we did for training this weekend, that's the one we're going to use for our medal. When, sure. When we get those medals. Why not? So. It's we, not like we're not going to do another 5K this month. That's true. <laughs> now, we were fortunate. This is the the week for us in our training cycle that is usually the shorter mm-hmm. long run. So yeah. last week, if you listened to the show, you heard about our nine and a half. Oh, yeah. 
this week was only a three miler. Yes. And usually if we're going to do a three miler, we just go ahead and round up to a 5k because. Yeah. We just finish off that point one, one. Yeah. So that's what we did. And we elected to head up to the Orlando area and stay on property and get an exp- the full experience there. So we stayed on property. We did our training run mm-hmm. there and we experienced the Epcot Food and Wine Festival. Mm. Let's talk about the run. Well, that's not the only run that we had. So let's talk about the running last week. Oh, and, okay. And well, then we'll, we'll, we'll cap it off with our training run at Epcot. Well, what can I say? You know, I put off last week's super long run until Tuesday. Mm-hmm. So I had to have um, back-to-back short runs here before we left. And how'd that go? Well, you never want to do that. You always want to have a day in between to kind of rest and, and do cross-training or what have you. But, uh, but I made it work. Yeah, usually if you're doing back-to-back runs, that's because you're training for like a race weekend where you're going to be doing back-to-back races. Right, like if in a challenge weekend at Run Disney or doing the booby trap challenge at the Donna Marathon weekend. Right. Yeah, where you want to train for those back-to-back days. But we're not really training for anything specifically like that, but I just wanted to play catch-up a little. Sure. So I just kept it really short on the back-to-back days and and did 30 minutes, did one day of drills and speed work. Mm -hmm. So cadence drills, acceleration gliders. And cadence drills are 30-second drills where you count your footfalls on one foot and you want to increase them with each drill. So the the purpose of that drill is to increase your turnover Mm -hmm. during... A 30-second period. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the benefit is in your walk and your run, the increased turnover. Right. And then the acceleration glider drill, which is 30 seconds where you kind of, you walk the first 10 steps and then you start a little bit of a light jog in the next 10 and then you you ramp up all the way to race pace and then you decelerate. You kind of glide out of the fastest pace and back to your walk it's supposed to train you to smoothly transition from your run to your walk back to your run which is if you're doing intervals like the galloway method which we do and for those that are new to the show we are galloway run walk runners so you know we we tackle all these races using that method Mm -hmm. that we're doing whether it's the virtual races we've been talking about since the pandemic began Mm -hmm. or prior to that our races that we were traveling all over the country to go and do no matter what the purpose we those are drills that we use that jeff galloway our coach yes we america's coach subscribe to coaching from jeff we we spoke with him about running in summer heat a couple of episodes ago, and he puts those drills in our training so that we can run, walk, run more efficiently. Yeah, and what I like about the acceleration glider drills is if you're getting into run, walk, run, I think that there are a lot of people that'll just go, oh, yeah, I, you know, I'll run till I get tired, I'll stop, and then I'll, I'll run again. Yeah. Okay. Walk for a little bit, then run again. Sure. Hmm. Having a little bit of the training from Jeff mm-hmm. and some of these drills helps take some of the pain points out of that. And and the main one being if you are running and you're getting up to race pace and then all of a sudden you start braking. And when I say braking, like putting on the brakes slowing and, and down. slowing down way too fast and just basically being too abrupt, you can actually end up jarring yourself pretty bad. You could... Twist your knee or whatever I would the say case. shin splints. Huge. Could, yeah. could be a result of that or something. You know, we're no medical experts, but no. you've got to train yourself for this method. And I think that it also puts you in the right side of your brain or in the forefront of your brain so that, as Jeff Galloway says, the monkey brain is not in, in charge and it's not arbitrary. Right. And... Those negative messages that creep in when you get tired on a long run or in a race, those negative messages can guide your running unless you come in with a plan. 
And right. that's part of these drills and yeah. part of the, the long run is the endurance. And then you get into counting your steps or you get into, I need to make it to one minute of walking or one minute of running or what have you, whatever your run, walk, run ideal ratio is. And it's different for everybody. And I think that when you start adopting something like run, walk, run for longer distance runs where you're going to be out on the road for one and a half, two and a half, three and, three and a half, half hours, hours. Yeah. Having good technique for entering into the run segment and mm. exiting out back into the walk segment is yeah. really important. It, it just keeps you from getting hurt, keeps mm -hmm. you from from being sore it or reduces the soreness. To practice the form. Yes. And make sure you're not leaning too far forward. There are lots of things that he tells us to pay attention to on those drills. Mm -hmm. Because the shorter the stride, the quicker the turnover can be. And the longer the stride, the more apt you are to kind of lean forward or push your legs too far forward and you risk injury. Right. So. Or, and a lot of people, they'll, to, I'm going to go faster by leaning forward. Mm -hmm. No, but you or, are definitely going to set yourself up for quite a spill if you end yeah. up tripping. Or widening your turnover. You're uh, increasing, oh, you're your, increasing your stride length. Your stride length. Yeah. You're increasing your stride length is just you make yourself more susceptible to injury that way, I think. I've done those drills and I've noticed an improvement in my turnover and yeah. and I've actually shortened up my stride length a good yeah. bit because when I first started a lot of the time what I would try to do is you know I'm I'm not that fast but by golly I can reach out with my legs and with I'm each tall. stride I'm going to I'm not tall I'm going to yes. cover more distance and what you end up with a lot of times is a, is a nice charley horse or mm. you know, cramp in your quadricep and your hamstrings and you know if you can avoid that so much the better yeah. So those yeah. are those are great drills to do. We're we're not medical experts, but we have seen improvement in our training from these drills. Yeah, we're just t we're sharing our experience and yeah. recommend you check them out, especially if mm -hmm. you're going to be new to the run walk run method and you're thinking about starting it. Mm -hmm. I believe Jeff talks about all of these drills on jeffgalloway.com. Yes, he has YouTube videos that kind of show what to do as well. He talks about them in his books. He will talk about them in those in uh, in some of the town halls that he's been doing lately on YouTube and in, in charge running uh, training groups, I'm sure. So that is just something that I have been mindful to do one of the short days every week. Mm -hmm. One of the short maintenance runs every week to make sure that I'm keeping good running form so I don't risk injury and, and I'm getting better form, which will better my time down the road. Smart. One of the things that will. What about you? Well, I squeezed in a couple of 5Ks yeah. ahead of our trip. So did those at work. Mm -hmm. um, nothing crazy. Just, just, you know, I knew that it was kind of a, a lighter week, so I just wanted to make sure that I was getting the mileage in. I yeah. wasn't really going for any times. And I'm also, again, I'm using some of these runs as a means to experiment with my new Garmin Phoenix 6X that you got me. Yeah. And I've been checking that out, and yeah. I've been answering some questions from listeners regarding the Garmin. That's nice. Yeah, a lot of people are very interested in them. And I'm going to probably do a segment on a show in the next few weeks where I, I talk about, you know, a specifically, you know, comparing and contrasting a watch like this Garmin 6X, which mm -hmm. is this beast of a, of a tool that's very specialized and very intense versus something that's a little more consumer friendly, like, like a Apple watch or a uh, Fitbit. Okay. You know, so um, there, there are a lot of people uh, and uh, regardless of which running group I look at online, you know, there's always that question, what's the best running watch for me to get? You right. know, I think it depends on your goals. It's absolutely going to be very dependent on the individual, but I can at least share some, some experiences that I've had mm -hmm. being, being a smartwatch user really yeah. since the beginning of mm. smartwatches. And now having had a few weeks with this watch mm -hmm. And, and like I said, just kind of give people some basis for comparison so that they can make a, a perhaps a, a better informed purchasing decision. Nice. And 
you might be the type that isn't necessarily going to choose one or the other. You mm. might be the type that goes for both yeah. and then has one as their daily driver and then one that's solely their running watch. Mm. So, you know, coming soon. Coming soon. But so I did those, I did a couple of 5Ks, played around with the watch, almost didn't track one of my runs. So then I was like, well, if I don't track it, it didn't happen. But I did. Well, yeah, mm. I, I hit the wrong button. Oh. <laughs> and and uh, then... We saved up the last run of the week, which was our long run, and we yeah. chose to do that at Epcot. Yes. And that's just laps around the World Showcase. Laps around the World Showcase, yes, with some hills built in if you go from England to France. Well, we call those hills. The people who live in really hilly countries make fun of us. I know. I know. You know who you are out there. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and... We're Floridians, so those are hills to us. Okay? But, That's all I'm saying. But I think I even got like a, a um, credit on my Garmin for going up at least a flight of stairs for that hill. You mean credit for elevation. Yes, elevation nice. credit. Nice. Yes. So yes, I'll take it. I believe it. that I got credit for it as well. I'll take it where I can get it. Yeah. So, yeah, so we did our, our, our final 5K basically is a couple of laps around the World Showcase. Yeah. And that, because our long runs with the Galloway method are not for time. Mm. And Jeff even says this, and he's told us this before. Yeah. Um, hey, it's it's a short, long run. Go walk the parks. Yeah. He's you told could, us that before. You could totally do it. And I will tell you, in that park this time we we've gone up there and we've done training runs before oh we have at parks this time we were we had a clear path oh yes if we'd have legitimately wanted to run run we could have we could have we totally could have in the middle of the day yeah now granted we would have had to do that in a a mask Yes, and I guess this this is a nice segue into mm-hmm. what's the overall experience yeah. going to the parks before we dive into the food and beverage. Um, yeah, we decided that we were going to stay on property mm-hmm. um, because right now uh, the Disney parks are open, but there's mm-hmm. kind of an asterisk next to that. Yeah, the parks are open and they have very limited availability. They are running at a just a fraction of the total occupancy. Mm-hmm that they normally would allow each day. True enough. True enough. So they have theme park ticket holders. They've purchased a a, a park pa- a ticket. Mm-hmm. And then there is a category of annual pass holders. And then there's the category of resort guests. Right. And you go on the Disney website and you select a, a day and it will tell you the availability within that category that you fit into. Right. And we are, we are normally annual pass holders. Mm-hmm. And even as annual pass holders, when we looked, there was very little availability for much of anything mm-hmm. at that point because yeah. they are so limiting the mm-hmm. amount of people in each park. Yeah. So we decided, well, let's, what would be available if we stayed on property? We looked, and all of a sudden, the world opens up. Yeah, the entire world. Walt Disney World, to be precise. Yes. So so we were able to get into Epcot because of that. So we stayed at the Animal Kingdom Lodge, and where we were staying there, even even the resorts are very socially distanced. Mm -hmm. Masks are required everywhere. Yes. If you are walking around, masks are required. Mm-hmm. Their cast members are letting you know, hey, if you forget, they'll, they'll remind you to put your mask on. Mm-hmm. If it falls down, they'll remind you to pull it up. It has to cover your nose and mouth. Mm-hmm. It can't be a gator, a neck gator or scarf. It has to be a an actual face mask with like ear loops or mm-hmm. tie behind your head. Mm-hmm. They are doing temperature checks yep. prior to going into the parks. Yes. And if you are eating or drinking, 
uh, you know, that's when you can take your masks off. As long as you're stationary. But you have to be stationary. So you can't walk around with a drink in one hand, food in the other, and constantly have your mask down. Right. Yeah. So chances are good somebody tried that, and that's why there's a rule now. Yeah. So. And they there are frequent announcements, um, like PSAs, I would say. Yeah, that are reminding you. That remind you of you can have your mask down when you are eating and drinking and stationary. Yes. Yeah. Now, that's everywhere. That's both at the resorts and at the parks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At the resorts, um, if you were staying on property, not every restaurant is open. That's true. So only certain restaurants are open, and you have to check the individual resort that you're you're looking to book at to see what's available. Yes. All uh, of the restaurants, the sit-down dining restaurants, are reservation only. Yes. Or they will do uh, a carry-out mobile. Um, to go. To go. To go. You can order it and take it back to your room. Now from they, some places. and But in the parks, they do have some of the quick service places mm-hmm. that are still open. Mm-hmm. And you can do the mobile ordering. This is actually something I think they need to keep. I thought this mm. was so cool. Mm. Um, and you can do the mobile ordering. And then you go and you pick up your food there. And then you can be seated at the quick service <laughs> restaurant they had it before the pandemic it's just Did not they? a lot of people knew about it i had no idea I thought not that a was, lot of people knew that about was it. pretty slick yeah mike but we're going to talk about that mike more pam and ricky on the be our guest podcast talks about they they talk about it a lot okay well as a tip that's a that's a great tip yeah so so everywhere you go and, and then they're constantly cleaning i mean disney oh yeah the, the cast members do no such joke. an amazing job normally anyhow mm-hmm. they are they've redoubled their cleaning efforts mm-hmm. and they're constantly spraying and wiping and and i mean all the time so yeah there there was never a time in the resort or the park that i would say that i felt unsafe that's true or that there was any danger you know or or that it wasn't clean enough right i felt good yeah i felt good i felt safe now i will say if you are not a person that enjoys wearing a mask and i don't know who would enjoy wearing a mask Mm. but um, or like you're you can't really tolerate it that well if you can't tolerate it especially because of the heat Mm -hmm. now may not be the best time of year to go right because it's brutally hot right now yes and in, in specifically talking about animal kingdom lodge if you're a fan of Jico or boma this may not be the opportunity to go now because those dining options were not available oh, at yeah. animal kingdom for us right so yeah so something to consider and, and things to think about but the fact of the matter is if you are a disney fanatic and you mm. want to go get your disney fix you can you can and i would say the upside of this because we were talking about doing the 5k and how there weren't really overwhelming crowds so we could have run if we wanted to yes with the mask on and uh, all of that said the wait times for really popular attractions oh yeah yeah um soren is basically a walk-on Test track. Um, test track is 20 minutes. Mission space. I I think the highest wait times we saw were for in, inside of Epcot were for test track and for the frozen ride. Yes. Yeah. And, and those are newer. Yeah. Newer mm-hmm. items. So yeah. still having some uh, some availability mm-hmm. um, issues or, or popularity, I should say. So, you know, not everything was walk on, but. Most things were pretty close to it and definitely way shorter than you normally would like see. Like the wait time would be maybe 20 minutes or less for most things. And I don't think that we waited for anything Mm-mm. in any park Mm-mm. more than 20 minutes. True. Total. So, and that, and we're going to talk more about that in, in, a, in the next couple of episodes. Yeah. As we kind of lay out everything that we did and sure. feature some other foods that we found there. Mm-hmm. But... The, the experience is, is provides you an opportunity to really get the rides in. Now, mm-hmm. the, the uh, one thing to kind of prep people for is oh. that some rides, yeah. they have pared down that experience a little bit. And, yeah. and what do I mean by that? Well, 
a lot of times they have these very f- fancy um, preambles to rides. Like when you go to the rock and roller coaster. Pre-show. You know, there's a little pre-show and everybody crowds into the theater, watches the video, and then you head into the rest of the queue. And it's those types of things are designed to get people, quote unquote, in the ride. Mm-hmm. And it, it's moving large clusters of people at one time. And it doesn't give you the illusion that you're still waiting for the ride. It's like the pregame as if you're there. You're building excitement. Building excitement. Getting buy-in. It's part of the attraction. A lot of those things have been temporarily suspended. Not that we went on Tower of Terror, but that's an example in Hollywood Studios where there's a pre-show that they don't have anymore. Right. So keeping that in mind, This is a great opportunity if you want to ride something multiple times. This would be a great opportunity to do that. But like if you need coaster therapy, something like that. But you are trading some of the some of the the pixie dust magic. Yeah, Yeah. you're trading some of the magic for the utility. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of that if you're thinking about going right now. I think you and I were talking about it over uh, during our experience there. And we uh, we were saying, you know, we're annual pass holders. We've been there again and again. So for us, it's not a first-time experience. Right. So we were okay with it. We made the most out of it. We had fun. The cast members were absolutely phenomenal. They were, really were. But I think if it's your first time, it may not be the time to go. I would agree with that completely. I especially and 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 we went to three parks while we were there, so we got to experience each one throughout the day. And I, and I think that some parks are a little bit better right now than others in terms of creating the magic. Yes, I think that it was a, a better An excitement overall experience at say Animal Kingdom than yeah. it was at Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And I think that Epcot was a stronger experience than Hollywood yeah. right now. And I think that part of that is because Hollywood Studios normally relies a lot more on the pop-up character shows that, that normally occur. Like the Jedi Training Academy that's outside of Star Tours? That. Like that? Or there's also those other, the actors that are riding around in the car, and then they do their little pop-up show on Main Street. And that creates the classic fun environment. And then you also have the smaller food vendors, which are just not open there. True. So, again, they've taken away all these congregation points, mm. but we understand why. Mm-hmm. But if you want, like, if you want that turkey leg uh, over at Hollywood, you're, mm. you're you're out of luck this time. Well, I didn't see a turkey leg in there. No, anyway. because Fairfax Fair is not open right well, now. That's one of the smaller food vendors. It's rough. So, again, it's rough. things to keep in mind. But fortunately for us, the Epcot Food and Wine Festival is open. Yeah, we're so lucky that they decided to reopen all the parks and actually have that going for an extended period of time. And you would think that with all the reading that we do of Disney that I would have noticed that the Food and Wine Festival was open and I just didn't. I, I talked I, to you about this. No, you didn't. I think I did. I promise you, you didn't. All right, then. Because <laughs> I would have remembered and I, I was glad to hear it. And Mm -hmm. we have some amazing food and beverage to bring you. We do. Like you said, an oldie but a goodie. Yes. And a newbie. Yes. So an oldie but a goodie. We, back in episode 86, we talked about Canada and Ireland because they both had a cheesy offering that we just loved. One soup and one dip. Yeah, and yeah. and I think that the difference there really was just the way they presented it because yes. you could call you could call both. either one of them a a cheese soup, soup or, or dip. dip. Yeah, so Ireland had a, like a sharper cheddar. Oh, and that Irish one was a sharp white cheddar and with a softer a soda bread stout. Oh, base and a softer uh, soda bread, right? Yes. And it was a brown bread. Mm-hmm. And just so we don't get your expectations too high or, 
set you up for disappointment. Ireland was not a booth that returned to the festival this year. Yeah, the, the, they do, while they are doing the Food and Wine Festival, the offerings are fewer Yeah, this year. But Canada was there. That's right. Canada. And I think that the Canada booth, they, they brought back because this is one of those booths that always, when you go to Food and Wine, has a line. Oh, because the yes. product that they put out is consistently fantastic. Not that Ireland was not, because it was. It was. And we miss it very much. But I can tell you that we have never consistently seen the lines mm-hmm. at the Ireland booth that we see at Canada booth. Right. And maybe there, I mean, I've, I've, read some rumors around i don't know if this is true that they'll open up additional booths as they see how everything unfolds and i I hope hope that's that's, yeah i hope exactly that's the case but to bring back to decide to bring back this classic because it is so high demand and so popular it is very smart the only thing that i would have liked for them to do is bring back one of their discontinued food items which one is that do you remember the chicken sausage Yes. That they used to do, yes. yeah, that was fantastic. But they, that that one has gone away. But what they did, or I don't know if they put it in its place, or if they just kept these two and decided to lean into these, yes, is what we got from Canada oh. this week. And mm. I'll let you start out with that. Okay, look, the Canadian cheddar bacon soup with the prop and peller pretzel roll it's like alliteration right there it is yeah and the la cellier wild mushroom beef filet mignon with truffle butter sauce yeah Uh. Mm. this is almost a we get this every time dish. Mm, Actually, yes. it might be a we get this every time dish. You know, we always talk about how we always go to Canada after a, ra- a yeah. run there. I think we might have featured it in another episode, like early in the show, a video one, like a yes. episode 10 or so. Yes. The Canadian soup. Ugh. But th- again, they, this one is so consistently good that it's one of those we just don't want to pass up. And so. So we're good. kind of celebrating the fact that it's back. Yes. Right now. Mm. So you're talking about a creamy cheddar soup with a real smoky hit of bacon and actual pieces of bacon in the soup. But it's balanced with the cheddar. It's yeah. not overly smoky. No. Just enough. And But the cheddar has a nice tartness. Mm-hmm. And, and comparing and contrasting, it's a different um, it, to last year when they had the Ireland. Mm-hmm. Um, dip yeah that irish cheddar is much sharper true so true this is a little less so it, it's mm. tart but it's a it's just a little more creamy oh. the mouth feel on the soup is just you know silky and Smooth. the pretzel roll oh the pretzel roll which doesn't have salt on it because it doesn't need it from with the bacon and the cheddar in the soup so good it's it's Got that pretzel exterior. That nice hard exterior. And then the soft inside. That's perfect for dipping. Yes. In the soup. You break it apart. If you both, if you get the cheddar bacon soup, you can have halfsies, halfsies mm-hmm. on the pretzel roll. You can. Mm. Now, this is one of those items, and, and, and we, we shared. Yes. But it is one of those. If you're, if you're going to kind of make that day your meal, you know, yeah. for, or you're going yeah. to maybe, you know, lunch and late afternoon snack. Mm-hmm. Get your own. It's, oh, okay. It, Fine. It, the, the portion is maybe, what, four ounces of soup? Probably. So it's not huge, but if you're just wanting a taste. But I also think that sharing these little bites at the different booths, then it it lends itself to having the opportunity to try more at different booths. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's so you can play it either way. Yeah. You can play it either way. I think this would be a perfect opportunity for each one of us to have the cheddar bacon soup. 
Well, and I was going to say, and then if you pair it with the <gasps> the Cellier wild mushroom fillet, oh my gosh! Now you're talking. Okay, this is a light lunch. Yeah, and it's a great lunch because <sighs> they they do their beef fillet. Now they're cooking a ton of fillet mignon. Yes. Now, chances are good mm. that unless you make a point of saying, "Hey, can you kind of get me a piece that's more rare?" Yeah, which we should have said. Because we, we like that medium rare. But even if you don't do that, because I, I commented on this. I said, I know. you know, I normally don't like uh, like my my filet medium or, you know, medium well even. Mm, mm. But this filet is fork tender. It was so tender even though it was maybe a little past the temperature we normally like. Mm-hmm. And some people would love that. They would. Yeah. Some people, uh, John, who's one of our founders over on Patreon, would love, would have loved the temperature on this. Okay. I think. In talking to him and seeing how he likes his stick. Mm -hmm. So. I like mine to moo at me. I, well, so do I. But, you know, you could actually, they would probably be very accommodating. All those cast members were so nice and so sweet. And I just. I know they'd probably bend over backwards to make you happy. Oh, they would. They would, and and it was not something that we really were upset about. And I no. wasn't even upset because no. again, you're getting this pile Ugh. of sautéed mushrooms with that truffle so, butter sauce so underneath. So woodsy. Yeah. Ah. You know, it's they kind of serve you this this piece of fillet on top of these mushrooms, Ugh. and that butter is melted over the over the steak and into the mushrooms. So and good. So you're getting this really nice okay. hit of mushroom mm. flavor mm. and texture. It just works. Yeah. It's delicious. We love it. And that's why we had to talk about an oldie but a goodie. So if you are going to find your way to Epcot, don't miss Canada. Yeah. But. We're, we're really hoping that they bring Ireland back too. That's just a PSA before we go on. Yes. Sorry. That's just a little plea to Disney. Thanks. <laughs> okay. But going with tried and true is certainly safe, and you're not going to go wrong, but there's a new kid on the block. Yes. there's. I thought you were going to say there's a new kid in town. Well, there is a new kid yeah. in town. Yeah. And, that, and new, that new kid is not even tied to a country. Not even tied to a country, but listen, when you pass one of those stands and the menu item says... A lobster tail. You have got to go. This is called Citrus Blossom, this new booth, this food booth. And it is located right when you when you go from Soren and you travel into the World Showcase passing right by the new Starbucks. It yep, is there's the new Starbucks on your right, mm -hmm. and on the left is the Hawaii stand. Yes, and if you keep going to one of the first food booths that you'll hit is Citrus Blossom. Blossom, right across from the Refreshment Port in Canada. Yeah. Refreshment Port is is kind of their permanent non, I was going to say non-denominational, non-country affiliated uh, refreshment uh, stand. It's that, refreshing. It's delicious. Everybody should stop there. But they have some hidden gems there oh, yeah. as well. And we'll talk more about them in a, on a later episode. Yum, yum. Anyway. Everything is yummy in this kind of part of the world showcase. I am telling you. Citrus Blossom citrus is blossom. focused on cooking food with a citrusy flair mm -hmm. of some sort. And we picked up both of the proteins yes. that they were offering. One of them was a half lobster tail served with a Meyer lemon emulsion and a grilled lemon served in the shell, in the half of the shell still. Yeah, they basically, skewered. they take the the lobster tail and they split it lengthwise. Oh. Then they grill it mm. and then they skewer the meat mm. and they serve it to you. Basically, you know, you've got the, the shell for presentation. Oh, yeah. But you pull the meat right out on a skewer. And it, it, it I'm, I know we haven't even talked about the other protein that we got, but it came right out of the shell. Right out of the shell, and that Meyer lemon emulsion. Oh my! I mean, I could drink that. 
Yeah, and, and the best way to it's describe creamy. this is if you've ever had a sushi where they, they do like the decorative drizzle of mm. mayonnaise. And that's what it looked like. That's the presentation. It had maybe, it, not as thick as a hollandaise, but the appearance of that yellow of hollandaise. Yeah. Yeah. And it wa- and it's in the album artwork for this episode this week. It It was creamy. It was a little bit tart because a Meyer lemon it's it's not as tart as the classic lemon Mm -hmm. and the but the grilled lemon was there so that you could have that classic lemon flavor a little squirt of lemon Mm -hmm, juice that acidity it was tender meat and it was just perfectly cooked and the lemon it's just I mean you just you just want to be by the water and having seafood. Yeah, and this surprised me. Uh, when we first saw this, we're like, wow, okay, this is new. Uh. And whenever I see, like at the food stands, I'm always a little nervous about doing shellfish. Okay. Because yeah. n- not for like like foodborne illness or anything, I'm nervous about them getting it right. Like because overcooking. Overcooking. Rubber. They tend to be doing these uh, on either a grill or a griddle. They're serving so many portions so quickly all the time. There's such a potential for them to overcook it. They don't. They didn't. They this was don't. absolutely perfect. Oh. The, the meat was buttery and tender oh. and just fantastic. And I could drink that lemon emulsion. And oh, that lemon emulsion was absolutely stellar Mm. Mm -mm -mm. and then i went with their other protein looked so good which is their crispy citrus chicken that they served with an orange aioli and baby greens Mm. so you get this beautiful breaded kind of orange in color chicken breast Mm -hmm. that has this this very crunchy exterior the breast is served in, you know, the little boat that they give you. And then it's got a little pile of, of microgreens on top. Mm. And those are, uh, those were tossed with something, but I wasn't sure, like maybe just a little bit of, um, uh, like a vinaigrette, maybe, or, or, or what I was thinking was maybe it was a little bit of orange juice and oil, mm. something. Cause everything in that, in, in that plate popped with maybe some an orange, orange flavor. Zest. Might have been Something. the. I'm pretty confident that the breading had some orange zest in it mm, because it looked good. I had, and and then it was drizzled with the orange aioli, very mm-hmm. similar presentation, and the, almost in color. I almost thought they were using the same thing on both dishes. At first, I did too. Yeah, um, turns out not so much. Yeah, and I, you know, I had part of the chicken without anything on it and Ooh. I was still getting that hint of orange mm. then when you would get it with the aioli mm. you know you got an extra pop of orange but it was never really sweet it and it wasn't too tart it mm. was just like a burst of orange flavor and aroma the chicken breast was perfect so tender tender juicy again White meat, I was not expecting because mm. I was thinking they're probably going to want to go with a safer meat that you could cook and is going to be juicy cooking a lot of it quickly. Mm. But they they went with the, the more difficult option, which was the chicken breast. Yeah. And then the baby greens gave you just a little hint of bitterness. So if you got the full bite, mm. you had, you know, the savoriness of the meat, you had the the freshness of the orange or the bitterness of the greens. Yeah. That was fantastic. And I, and I even said this would make an amazing sandwich. Oh yeah. I think it, the citrus blossom booth is somewhere you want to eat without a doubt at the Epcot food and wine festival. But before we go on, there are many ways that you guys have been supporting the show. We've just recently had some of you, purchase some clothing from our store Mm -hmm. and we cannot thank you enough for repping the run eat drink podcast when you're out there on your run shirts we love it they they make you run faster and look more attractive to others out there disclaimer they don't actually i don't think they increase your speed but they're great (laughs) 
Yeah. And those purchases do, uh, in fact, help us keep the lights on here. Mm-hmm. We've also had um, folks, you know, say, well, you know, I, what else can I do to support you? They're, you know, leaving some fantastic reviews over on the Apple Podcasts. Yes, which uh, is part of the reason that we grow our Runcation Nation and we get discovered. And the more times folks do that, that means the more often people see our podcast when they're searching. Yeah. And that really helps us out more than we can say because it's mm-hmm. all about the algorithm when it comes to that. A lot of runners we met at races... They have said to us, hey, we'd like to support you more long term because we've listened to your back catalog and that and some great race recaps and things like that. And we just we want you to keep going, to keep accomplishing, exploring and indulging and bringing that to us and making a community for back of the pack runners. How can we do that? Yeah, and, you know, everybody who gets into running knows it's more than just a pair of running shoes. Yeah. (laughs) And especially if you're traveling. So we put together our Patreon, and we came up with three different levels Mm -hmm. uh, of of monthly support, $2, $5, or $10. And each one of those has perks kind of commensurate with the dollar amount. Mm -hmm. And that gives members of the Runcation Nation, an opportunity to support the show and help us keep the lights on, the bandwidth flowing, the the hosting happening. And then giving you all a little bit in return for those dollars that you contribute to help us. Yeah, whether it's acknowledgement or some some special content, Mm -hmm. insider, some behind-the-scenes stuff, whatever the case may be, um, we just can't thank you enough regardless of which level you choose Mm -hmm. your support means the world to us and it really does help us keep going yes and our show will always be free but if you're looking for a way to support the show because you want to see more of those behind the scenes bonus content and more then go to patreon.com slash runny drink podcast and if you're on the Podbean platform listening to us at the top of our um of our podcast page, just click on the button, become a patron. All the same levels are right there for our Podbean users. And we can't thank you all enough for supporting the Runny Drink Podcast. Well, this is the Food and Wine Festival. Yeah, I'm thirsty even just thinking about what we had. We talked about food. Let's talk about beverage. And we had beverages from both the Canada booth and the Citrus Blossom I can't even, it's like I am um, trying. The Citrus Blossom Booth. There you go. This alliteration, I, I'm working it out. There you go. Yeah. And both Canada and that booth gave us brand new offerings. They did. And it was really nice to see some stuff that was different because they from yeah. time to time, you know, year to year, you'll see some stuff repeat. Sure. And getting a little bit of variety in there is always a good thing, especially since we went to a country we had done before. Yes. And in Canada, they provided for us from Hamilton, Ontario. We had the Collective Arts Blackberry Fruit Beer. Yeah, this one... Um, yeah, really, uh, was was a shocker for me. Four point seven percent ABV, mm-hmm. and the color. Well, well I mean, you start. I yeah, mean, the color it's like a blackberry. It was like it was, or a really dark red wine. Bingo. And I say that because it's not when you say uh, blackberry fruit beer or any kind of fruit beer, immediately sometimes my brain will go to, oh, it's a dessert. Mm -hmm. It's going to be really sweet. A lot of fruited beers are. Yeah. But this one was not. This one was a little bit lower in carbonation, and it had blackberries uh, on the aroma and a drier finish so that it was almost like a dry red wine. And I loved it. I loved it. I I would have it again. I thought it was very refreshing. The body was not overly heavy. And the mouthfeel, it didn't coat your mouth or like maybe a syrupy sweet dessert beer might. And I would definitely have it again. You? I thought that when they poured it, I looking at the color... I at first thought the exact same thing. I said, ooh, this is probably going to be really, really sweet. Mm-hmm. And then when I first smelled it, 
it smelled like you had cracked the lid on blackberry preserves. Oh, yeah. And, and I was like, oh, this is definitely going to be sweet. I In my mind, I'm just, I'm preparing myself. And when you have that first sip. No. It's much more like a, like like you said, almost like a, a red wine. Mm-hmm. Not quite that dry, but it was just a nice hint of blackberry mm-hmm. aroma all the way through. Yeah. The lightness of it surprised me too. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the color made me think it was going to be heavier in body. It wasn't. This was a great hot weather beer. And it was great with the beef. Oh, very much so. It just complemented the woodsy flavors, the earthiness of the meat. Yes. So great. So good pick. Yeah. What about you? Well, over at the Citrus Blossom booth, when I saw who they were pouring, I had to have it. Of course. And they were pouring a beer from a podcast favorite. Oh, yes. A place that we have actually been Indeed. multiple times. Yes. And they were serving Isla Morada Beer Company's Coconut Key Lime Ale. Which we haven't had from them. I don't believe we have. No. And that could be that this might be a an exclusive for right. Disney. Because that Because happens. Disney does that. Yeah. But this one comes in at 5% ABV. Mm-hmm. And this is clean, crisp, light in body, very refreshing. And it gave you the hints of coconut and key lime mm. without being too tart. Right. And without tasting like suntan lotion. So it was balanced and it, it wasn't taste, it didn't have an artificial almost like, you know, you would used an extract or something. Correct. Yeah. This tasted very real. Well, it tasted very real. I mean, it, it yeah. tasted like the fruit as opposed to mm-hmm. a fruit flavoring or syrup. And the essence of the coconut. So I I think that both of the offerings we had, the fruit beer from Collective Arts and the Isla Mirada, make me want to go to the Keys and yeah. just be at the beach with those particular beers. Yeah, you couldn't go wrong with either one of these. Yeah, um, I, I, amazing. I, th- I think that the Collective Arts was a bigger surprise for me. Agreed, agreed. Because... You know, we've we've had some experience with Isla Morada's products in the past, love and them. we love them. But you know, that beer, uh, in terms of color, was was like a, a, a nice golden. It was mm. very clear. Yeah. It had maybe a little more carbonation. It was maybe maybe uh, moderate carbonation, uh, closer to high. Mm. So it had a nice effervescence to mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. Um, but. It didn't surprise me like the collective arts did. I would go back and I would have it again. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. Well, both of them, but I would go back and I would have that blackberry fruit beer. And I just think that if you're a wine drinker and you don't see a wine offering at the Food and Wine Festival that you really wanted, this could be suitable on a hot day for you. Yeah. Actually, I would say that if you're a, if you're typically a wine drinker, mm. But you're and you're not and you tend to shy away from beers, but you're looking maybe to experiment. It would be a great entry way. I think so. Into what and and really harken back to what you expect normally from a red wine. Exactly. Like a Cabernet or Merlot, something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So excellent offerings from Canada and from the Citrus Blossom booth. And uh, it, it was a, a nice little getaway. It was, it and it, it was nice to be able to do that, and we cannot say enough good about the hard work that the yeah. men and women uh, that are employed mm. at Disney are doing right now to yeah. try to create some of that magic for you and work yeah. around what we're having to work around in terms of, of physical distancing and and. It had to be such a masks. challenge. So they've done an excellent job, and they've done the best they can in the circumstances. Yes. So we'll have more to share with you from Walt Disney World and more training updates next week from us. It's a training week. Um, we have a scheduled long, long run. It may be adjusted because of a little boo-boo. Somebody rolled their ankle this week. Yeah, I just, you know, I got to be, 
I was caught up in the Disney magic, not really paying attention, and I just had a little roll of the ankle. So I think that maybe I'm going to ask Jeff, I'm going to write to Jeff and say, you know, maybe I need to postpone a week. Is that doable in our schedule? I'm sure he'll say yes. Plus, yeah. you can always train around that doing some of your yoga and mm-hmm. all that. So Yeah. So more to come with the training recap and more to come from Disney. Yes. So if you love what you hear and you want to help us keep the lights on, like we mentioned before, you can become a patron of the show. We have multiple patronage levels from $2 to $10, and each has their own special perks just for you. Find out more and support the show at patreon.com slash running drink podcast. Or if you're a Podbean user, you can go to patron.podbean.com slash running drink podcast. Or if you're in the app up in the at the top of the page, just click the button that says become a patron. Thank you guys for joining us on your long run, your commute to work, around the house, or wherever you are. I'm your host, Amy. And I'm your co-host, Dana. Stay safe and well, and we will talk to you really soon. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. We're having another great year thanks to your support. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We're at Run, Eat, Drink podcast. And on Twitter, we're Run, Eat, Drink pod. You can also give us a call at 941-677-2733 or send us an email at info at runeatdrink.net. Visit our website at runeatdrink.net and click on the subscribe link so you don't miss a minute. Find out how you can support the show at patreon.com slash runeatdrinkpodcast. Accomplish, explore, and indulge right along with us. We'll talk to you next time.